So we're here to talk about relationships tonight. And uh, I think the last couple of lectures have not been about relationships. It always seems to be a place I kind of naturally default to, um, given that it was the uh, event in my life, uh, a breakdown in a relationship that really was the, the most frightening experience of my life, as, all, as well as being one that really woke me up. So I'm sure I'm not the only one that shares that kind of view about the power of relationships, correct? I mean, it seems like most things you can prepare for, you can predict and prepare and plan, but relationships are like at their best and their, or at their worst, or like a roller coaster without any brakes. And I certainly, that would characterize the kind of relationship that I was in for about 13 years that really was uh, precipitated the whole birth of Claremont. It was the crisis that I landed in at the, the end of this relationship, where that phrase, my life is your fault, certainly would have characterized most of the communications that were going on. And I don't think it's that inaccurate for describing, if not blatantly, subtly what goes on in most relationships most of the time. Many of us put on a, a nice, cooperative, polite facade, and underneath we're wrestling with some pretty vicious feelings about who owes us, how come we're in the state we're in, who we're blaming for it. And so tonight, I really want to focus on, for any of you that have been to the previous lectures on relationship, we focus on a lot of different dynamics around relationship. But tonight I really want to zero in on one particular aspect of it. And I think it's probably the most important thing to address in relationships, to really uh, let them become what they're supposed to become. If you can integrate some of what we're going to be talking about here tonight. It, can, it really can change your life in my mind, as it changed mine. Although I didn't have any teachers to tell me this, I had to figure it out myself. So, uh, let me tell you a bit about that relationship. I grew up in a family where I was, had three sisters, a mother, and an alcoholic father. And I prided myself on being uh, kind of a little superman to make up for the uh, supervillain that my father was seen as in the family. Because when he drank, he did some pretty bad, nasty things when he came home. And I kind of wanted to define myself on being anything but like my father. Did a lot of work on that my whole life, around redefining my relationship with my father. But certainly I went into adolescence designing my male character as being an antithesis of what my father was. In fact, I was going to be a priest at the age of 11 and 12. But boy, I tell you, did that score a lot of points with women? <laughs> really did. I mean, I was just the talk of my huge family system. My father, there was nine siblings in his group, and my mother had 11 in hers. I mean, there was a, and everyone was procreating like mad. And... Uh, I was just this new hero in the whole family system. I'm going to be a priest. And they're both Catholic families. And basically what I was doing was saying, you know, I want to equate my uh, maleness by eliminating my maleness. And to become the savior or servant of women. And so I went into my adolescence as a superhero and uh, I rescued a lot of, of, of wounded birds, right? And I became even more popular as being this little superhero. And um, I don't think, though, that that's what the universe or God or whoever, however you want to view that, uh, if there was a script for me, I don't think that was the one I was supposed to lead. And the universe has a way of getting you back to where you're supposed to be by bringing you the lessons you're supposed to experience to get you back on track, you know? Basically, the idea that I made up, that I have to be Superman in order to be accepted, is not a correct notion 
I was, a, I was actually supposed to be a 12-year-old who was actually going through a lot of agony and pain, who was supposed to actually be cared for as well, as opposed to just rescuing everybody. And, and somehow I, I had to be brought back to that place of when am I going to let that 12-year-old return to my life? It's strange because at 12 years old, at 12 years old, I developed colitis, which put me in the hospital, and I loved it in there. I didn't want to leave the hospital. I was in there for two months, and all the nurses liked me, and uh, they're all women, except that they were having to serve me. It was like that was the only way I could accept caring was I had to be hospitalized to get it. All right, so I, I, I go through adolescence like any other teenager. I was into sports and dating and having fun and, and uh, all those things. And I ran into a, by the time I was 30, I'm sorry, how old was I? Yeah, I was 30 when I met this woman, We're beginning this 13-year relationship. And I was Superman. She saw me as Superman. She was attracted to me as Superman. And she was equally a wounded bird. Meaning she came from, she came from a family where her mother uh, abandoned her at the age of three. Didn't see her again until she was 19 years old. Sexually abused by her father from the age of nine to 13 as were her sisters. Father was diagnosed as being a, a paranoid schizophrenic when she was uh, 10 years old. Terrible, terrible story. She left home at the age of 14 and started on her own. But she certainly brought into her life this need for someone to replace this evil man in her life. And guess who showed up? Somehow we met each other, we had to meet each other, for two reasons. The first reason is people meet each other because we think we're going to meet somebody that is now going to um, rescue us in some way from the misery that we think we're feeling inside, if we were really that honest and admitted what's going on inside, and our struggle with being human and this human dilemma and this perpetual series of losses and pain, and we looked to this fantasy figure to rescue and save us. And we were absolutely perfect for each other, because what I needed rescuing was not so much to get me out of my role as Superman. What I needed in that state was to have something reinforce it. So in order to keep my lofty image alive, what does Superman need? Hmm? He's not going to meet Superwoman, is he? They can't save each other. They don't need to be saved. I needed, to, I needed the wounded bird to save, to keep my sense of myself up and alive, to protect a part of myself that I didn't want to face. And that was I made up underneath it all that there was something wrong with me that that 12-year-old could not, well, did not deserve actually to be cared for. And there's something wrong with me that it didn't happen that I had to invent this character to replace the one that I thought wasn't good enough. And we've all done this in varying degrees. We have a self we fear covered up with a self we've invented, and the invented self is the one we propel into our 20s to to start running our life. And none of us are going to get away with it. We're not allowed to get away with the idea that there was something wrong with us. The invented self is not supposed to succeed, and it can't succeed and does not succeed. So my Superman meeting this wounded bird, she wanted also to remain the wounded bird, but now have a dad, a good ending to a bad old story. She's going to have a dad, me, that's now going to give her everything her dad didn't not going to change her mind about herself, nor am I going to change my mind about ourselves, but we're going to construct the relationship. And this is what we all do when we meet somebody. 
You quickly design who's going to save who, how. Within seconds. You read each other. You get a sense of each other. I knew exactly what to turn on the moment I met her. And so did she. And so we constructed our relationship based on, on rigidifying who we were, but now the other is going to complete us in some way. It's going to make us feel better, rescue us. And so things like this would happen early on in the relationship. Early on in the relationship, uh, we were very cocooned. We were so in love and so enraptured with each other. It's okay. Every time I say that word, something like that happens. (laughs) Somebody just loses it. (laughs) We were so... uh, Those first two, two weeks, I think most of us are trying to... We spent the next 13 years trying to get back that first two weeks. first two weeks were astounding. With, I think when we meet like that, you know, we really are in relationship with what can be, which, what might be, the fantasy of what's possible. And we are so enraptured <laughs> with the notion we're more making love and excited and falling in love with what might be rather actually than what is. But it gives us a glimpse of what's possible. But I don't, think, I don't think that's a strange concept. I think most of us probably can relate to that. We spend most of the rest of our relationship trying to get back that first couple of weeks, right? Right? What do we have to do to get it back? Well, there's a reason why it's not coming back. Anyway, so here, there we are in that first two weeks. And I'm finally going to introduce her to my friends. And I uh, haven't met anybody yet. Hasn't, we've just been in bed the whole time. Well, that's a great way to, to, to lose weight, you know. <laughs> just don't eat. Don't go anywhere. Just erode. <laughs> and uh, so there we are. I'm going to introduce you to my friends. And uh, we're getting out of my car. We're walking down the sidewalk to this house where uh, there's a party. Uh, I had a lot of friends and a lot of people in there. And they're all kind of fascinated about who this new woman in my life is. And as we're walking, she starts walking slowly. We're holding hands, she's walking slowly. And she says, I don't know if I can go in there. And I said, how come? She said, well, you, you know, um, you know my past. Like, I'm, 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 I'm really frightened of abandonment, Dwayne. Like, you know a lot of people in there. She says, you're a popular guy. You know, I don't know if I can handle it with you being around other women here tonight. I don't know. I don't know if I can handle it. And I heard a little voice inside of me go, "Here I come to save the day." <laughs> yes, I shall stand beside you. <laughs> I will not leave your side. I will protect you. I will not leave you. I'll be the man that no man has ever been for you in the past. I am your hero. Right? So, she's the wounded bird, and I'm the hero, and into the party we go, and I feel like a bodyguard (laughs) with her behind me, you know, and nobody's coming near us. (laughs) We're at a party. Asked her to dance, she says, I don't want to dance. And it was kind of a a, a snapshot of how we are, the deal we're making about how we're going to run our relationship. I am now the hero. You know, my life, the the lines we gave each other there at that time in those first two weeks is, uh, my good life is to your credit. (laughs) We applaud what the other one is doing for us. 
right? My happiness is because of you. Unfortunately, we don't know what the, what the uh, conversely, what the underbelly of that agreement is. And that is, as time goes on here, because it's impossible to connect and be intimate at the level of fantasy and mask, eventually things have to crumble. They have to break down. Because the battleground that I brought into this relationship, which is I actually am not worthy of being loved for what I am, remains inside of me. And as the relationship progresses, and I'm actually not feeling better inside, that belief that I am not good enough starts to have a life. It starts to see things happening in the relationship to prove that I am not good enough. I start to look outside myself to find evidence. So that I'm not looking inside myself from where it came from. I'm looking outside of myself at the things that are triggering it. I start finding evidence as actually other men started looking at her. That I would find, I would get jealous Scared, trying to start churning up my superpowers some more. And the miser- misery that I had inside of me before I met her just begins to resurface. And now I'm going to hold her responsible for it. She is no longer rescu- she is no longer treating me like the superhero in fact because she's carrying her suspicion of herself as a wounded bird you know all the things that she made up about herself because of what her dad did to her and what her mother did to her leaving her the things she made up about herself are going to begin to because she can't allow herself actually to be saved because she doesn't think she's worthy of it I will turn from superman into Darth Vader And we will now hold each other responsible. The pain that I have that is re-emerging is her fault because she's not giving me enough strokes on the back. She's not, she's not uh, letting me know I'm Superman. She's telling me I'm Darth Vader. I tell you, and that was the hardest thing for me to accept. I had never had that experience before in my life with women. That whole image, that facade that I, that I constructed so, constructed so well completely shattered. And I fell into a deep and dark depression in 1991, a profound depression. I no no longer knew who I was. And I was out of place of making her, I was so victimized by what she did. Because in her belief that I was not the Superman she thought I was supposed to be, in fact I was this Darth Vader, she was now chasing other Supermen. And that was like my Achilles heel. And the battleground, the battleground was still outside of self. You know, she was making me feel bad. I I didn't do it right for her. And the battleground is in the relationship instead of self. And the point I want to make here tonight more than anything else, regardless of whether you are new to this work, you know, I know there's people here that have come here for the very first time, that have not done our workshops, There's other people here that are seasoned veterans in workshops, not only ours, but in addicted to every workshop possible. (laughs) I see a lot of faces from a lot of different communities here tonight. Regardless of, of, of where you are in that, I want to be able to speak in a way that everybody understands. Because I think this this point is is central to the dilemma of what we're all going through in relationships, not just the ones that are taking workshops. And that is that we have to change our mind about where the battleground actually is. If I am so scared about facing my battleground inside of myself, and it is the, it is the most difficult thing to address, I really do believe that a warrior is a person that is hunting for himself. 
And there's not many warriors around, let me tell you. True. Of who's willing to face their own internal dilemma. More, we are so, so terrified of meeting that place inside of ourselves. Not realizing it, actually. That that meeting of ourself, and I use the word warrior for a very specific reason because I think it taps into, into um, uh, aboriginal rites of passage that we're all here to go through a rite of passage about meeting this aspect of ourselves and to move through it to discover something quite profound about ourselves that we in the Western world are so far removed from even remotely understanding that kind of rite of passage. We are so busy into the world of adolescent fantasy about getting rescued and rescuing and filling each other up and hiding out from each what we really are. We're so terrified of that. We're so terrified of taking a look at this battleground that we need the battleground to be outside of self. And this is what couples tend to collude to do together. For all those couples here that are finding themselves in difficulty and conflict and issues or relationships that have ended, where you get to that place where my life is your fault and now I'm leaving you, you need a dysfunctional relationship to focus where the battleground is so you don't have to focus on the battleground inside of yourself. You don't want those issues resolved so much. Because if those issues get resolved, all those things that you think you're so right about, about the other, if those get resolved, guess what has to happen then? Yes, you have to let somebody in. And you don't want that. You want it, but you don't want it. You wish and dream and fantasize about it, but the moment somebody gets close, boy, oh boy, is that a difficult place to enter. (laughs) Because they're going to have to meet the part of you that you don't like in your mind. And you are unconsciously going to defend against that at all costs, men and women. Men primarily, stereotypically, avoid that dilemma by underfunctioning and distancing. Women primarily face that dilemma stereotypically by overfunctioning. But that's a, the same and equal opposite way of hiding, being in control. We follow me in this, please. If you can get this, it will mean so much. Because you're, you're, how you view your position in your relationship will determine what you really see the problem is, and that's what the real solution is. And if you're not seeing the right problem, you're never going to find the real solution. So long as you think that battleground is the battleground outside of you, and all the energy you put into trying to change it, change him or her, all the talking you do with everybody around you about him or her, all that energy is for naught. It is like putting out fire with gasoline in terms of trying to rectify the problem. And yet, we remain kind of dysfunctionally addicted to perpetuating the problem because we need it outside of ourself. It's safer there. You're safer there. That's why a lot of people stay in relationships that are dysfunctional for a long time because the prospect of being alone Usually, particularly for men, particularly for men. Most men in relationships are really made up that I don't get what your problem is. (laughs) Everything's fine. You know, we pay our rent, there's food on the table, barbecues, mediocre burgers on the weekend. Everything's okay, we go on vacations. Don't quite get that there's something more going on here but they get it when the relationship ends. That's why five times more men commit suicide than women do. Because by the time it ends, because they haven't dealt with it at all, when it hits, it's the battleground reveals itself inside of self. And men are so ill-equipped to know what to do with it when, it emer- when it's there. 
And so we, we tend to keep this battleground in the relationship, not realizing that we are now kind of arresting the whole process. We are now in a perpetual state of defense rather than in love. And we scratch our skulls and say, how come that first two weeks can't show up here again? Because you're in relationship with your wall. You're in relationship with the lenses you wear in terms of what you see and fear. The sex disappears. How could it exist when most of the time you're frightened? A lot of relationships can default just into a kind of a nice, placid state of being well-behaved, but still it's out of fear to never look at each other in the eyes and never talk and never, never ask about this, inquire about this rite of passage that we're going through every phase of our life together for couples that have been together for years and years and years. The one you married when you were 23 is not the one you're with when you're 53. And yet you should be checking in with each other about your passage through time and who you are, but we don't want to do it. Instead, we get to this place where we just kind of feel like my, my position, my, where I've ended up, is your fault. Even though where I am is where I was before I met you. The feeling I have, this unhappiness, is what brought me to you in the first place. I felt that unhappy. And now I'm going to hold you responsible for the unhappiness that I had before I even met you. How far away we get from facing a real, real dilemma. And I watch myself in my, with my current relationship, Catherine, who many of you know. Uh, we've been together for 10 years. And I remember in the, in the, in the early years, and this, this is a process that continues on and on and on. I used to say to myself, you know, I... Boy, I miss my, my bohemian musician life, <laughs> right? I mean, I used to be a recording musician, had records out and traveled and, and uh, wrote songs and just... Uh, and now I'm a married man and I have a stepdaughter and I drive her to school. And, you know, and I'm busy with Clear Mind. I'm teaching here and in Toronto and London and Liverpool and Dublin and Stockholm and wherever else. And running this retreat center and this practitioner training program with 100 students and administering and managing. And, and I'm saying to her something, you know, gee, I just don't have any more time for my guitar. As soon as I pick it up, you, you want me to do something else. kind of saying to myself, you know, my, my, my current life of not having creativity in it is your fault. <laughs> right? Or Clearmind's fault, or the world's fault, or God's fault, somebody's fault. And so we did this interesting exercise. We did this interesting exercise. Because Catherine's so damn clever for those... <laughs> I mean, she's too smart for me. But I gave a lecture a while back that said, you are who you sleep with, so I, uh, I must be doing something right. In any event, uh, we, 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 she concocted this exercise. Well, I actually did it with... No, it's not true. I, did, I was doing this exercise with couples in my couples therapy and told her about it, and that was a mistake. <laughs> it's always a mistake with her, because she'll always end up saying, so what about you and me? And the exercise was this. The exercise was this. It was actually for a, a it's usually designed for somebody that's, that's in fear in a relationship, that needs to be in charge or control of everything all the time, and have a real hard time relinquishing control or management. Everything has to be negotiated. <laughs> Nothing can change. We've got some rules here. And so the, the exercise was this. You know, I would assign, I would assign the one that was not trusted the one that was the second-class citizen in the relationship, to be in charge of the relationship for a week. And when I say in charge, I mean in charge. Before the week starts, person A, the controller, the original controller, the one that's fear-based, writes down the things that are 
essential for this upcoming week in terms of his, his or her personal life, right? You know, I've got a doctor's appointment at Thursday at 11 o'clock. You know, I've got to go to work <laughs> from 9 to 5. It's just the, the basics. And, and the other person uh, gets this sort of list and is in charge of that week to take care of self, the other, and the relationship, to plan everything. Meaning the, control, the, the new controller, let's just say person B, okay, person B that's stepping up to the plate to take charge of the week, organizes everything. What time we get up, um, what we eat, what we do together, when we have sex, how we have sex, <laughs> dinners, when we watch television, computer time, self time, right? Self time. And I tell you, boy, does this throw a, an alarm clock into those control freaks. <laughs> when they have to relinquish this. And of course, Catherine said, so maybe we should try that. <laughs> okay, all right. You know, and I'm terrified. I think, you know, boy, I think I have a hard time finding creative time now. <laughs> Wait till she gets a hold of my life. <laughs> you know, my worst, my, the, my worst ego terror coming from a family where I felt like there was no place for consideration of me that if I give myself over... Um, you know, she's going to suck the very life right out of me. <laughs> There'll be nothing left of me. I'll be done. This is one voice running. Believe me, it doesn't run my life anymore. Uh, so I gave my, my life over to her for a week. Right? And I was shocked. I was kind of stunned and shocked at how sensitive she was to me and my apparent needs. She wrote in time for me to, because I, I always told her, I said, you know, one of the things I, ha I have to do and I haven't been doing in years is, is late at night on a clear night. You know, one of my things is I just love to go and look up at the stars and just meet the universe, you know, alone. Not a romantic walk talking about a relationship and hearing the Everly Brothers sing to us. <laughs> <laughs> No, alone and, you know, meeting the cosmos in a way. And, uh, and I had done that in years. You know. So she wrote that in. She wrote, she wrote the, that in to our, my week, two nights I get to do that. And she also set up my appointments with my clients such that I had an hour a day to be with my guitar. And then I got, I got a little studio but my, my, for those that have been in my office, I have an office slash studio. It looks like a DJ booth. I mean, I got a thousand CDs on the wall and a couple of gold records on there and guitars and 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 and, and recording equipment. You know, I can you know I can put some tracks down. <laughs> and so I go into I go into this you know I go into this my studio and I pick up my guitar. And nothing happened. <laughs> and I realized I, it was such a profound experience because I realized that my real fear was not whether or not the world or Catherine was going to allot me the appropriate amount of time for me to engage in my creative activity. My real fear was, oh my God, maybe I don't have any creative energy. <laughs> And I'm busy, and that's the real battleground. And I'm busy blaming, you know, I'm pretty clever too. You know, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a spiritual leader, right? I can't just go around blaming people. <laughs> uh, I can't, uh, you know, launch into the kitchen and start screaming and yelling. No, I got to be much cooler than that. <laughs> so I just sort of hold it inside as I'm reading The Course of Miracles. <laughs> Just kind of hold it inside. 
And, but I'm, I'm kind of just holding her responsible. You know, it's a damn relationship. There's no room for me anymore. And what a shock it was when I was given the space that the real battleground was inside of me. It was such a, for, for you know, it, I, I, I suggest this exercise for any couples in the room. But get some help with it. <laughs> Don't just do it on your own. Come and book an appointment with somebody. Um, I have some openings if you want. <laughs> um, it is such a profound experience because what it actually allowed me to do was to redefine what is the problem actually. And this is the point of tonight, is to get sober enough to ask yourself that question, what is the real problem? To what extent are you busy blaming him or her or this or that about anything? I'm not just talking about romance here. I'm talking about your life. I'm talking about your attitude to what's going on in the world. How busy are you keeping that battleground outside of yourself, complaining about that battleground? As you're complaining about it, how much of you needs it to keep it out there so you just do, do not have to address the battleground inside of yourself? Do you know that that impasse in relationship is not a sign of things being problematic? It's a sign that the relationship is evolved It's going through its developmental task of coming to this critical crossroads where the adolescent fantasy has fallen off. And what's left in its place is this kind of crude uh, depiction of both of your pasts staring at each other. Because that's what we see in our fears, our past. We call it reality, but there's another reality beyond that one. Once we start, the reason you're together, the reason you're together, the reason you're that attracted, the reason you're there in the first place is you need someone that's going to trigger those pieces of your past such that you can heal those pieces of your past. So don't be alarmed that when you get to this impasse, you're on schedule. The problem is most people leave at this point or die in the relationship at this point and just become sort of passively invisible with each other. They're in a, structurally, you're in a relationship. You have all the structures, the house, the car, the activities, the kids, but there's no relationship. So either it ends or it just gets kind of functional and not realizing that you actually are at a place where something magnificent can happen. Where we move from my predicament is your fault too. My predicament is my responsibility. And to begin to see the depth and importance of your life that encompasses a lot more than the, the cups and saucers on your dining room table or how much money you got in your bank account. That your, your, human, your human dilemma is moving through into mythology around who you are and your relationship much, you know, I really believe that relationships are here not so much to be a source of everything, more to come together to support each other, to discover the source of everything. And how could we know that in the Western world? Where do we get that message in the Western world? Where did we get it from our parents? Where do we get it on television? Where do we get it opening up magazines? We don't get that message. You don't know that message. You don't even know what to ask yourself when you're in that place, but to say to yourself, there's something wrong here. Maybe I should take Prozac. Not realizing, and I'm not here to say Prozac's a bad thing or antidepressants are a bad thing, but I think they certainly are well over-medicated, covering up sometimes what is a pivotal stage in somebody's life. We don't know that. We just experience discomfort, and we think we've got to take a pill for it. We feel discomfort in our relationship and we think we have to have an affair. We feel discomfort in our relationship, we think we have to turn on the television. You don't realize this discomfort is on schedule. But we're never going to find out what that is. We are never going to find out what that is if we remain perpetually pointing our finger outside of self and either rewarding the other for our happiness or punishing them for not doing it anymore right. 
We will never get close to it, and we will die. We will die not realizing the function of our existence was to move beyond that. And this is the work, really, you know, this is not some quick pop psychology weekend. I, you know, I think the people that work with Catherine and I and that we've trained and the work, all these things that we do are all kind of aligned to this phenomenal respect for the passage of what it means to be human. That it's not a quick thing. It's, a, it's being willing to enter the stream of the mystery of your existence. that there's actually something beyond the discomfort or beyond your internal battleground, that there's something else even beyond that. I mean, what if you knew that to be a fact? I had a, we had a couple in, in one of the lectures a few years ago, and they were, they were uh, celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary that day or the day before or something like that. They were sitting right there. And, and one of the exercises we did in the lecture was have, have people just look at each other. We do that now and then. I don't know you will do it tonight, too. Doesn't that scare you? <laughs> you look at somebody. And uh, we had them look at each other just for like a couple of minutes, silently, just looking into somebody's eyes. And I always have to remind people doing this exercise, I mean, I don't think there's anything that scares people more than that. That actually you're not going to bleed, you know, we're not going to need paramedics. You're not going to be in any danger at all. In fact, this is a short-term relationship. It's only going to be two minutes long. <laughs> that's still, there's this terror. There's this terror. Well, there's two parts. There's one that's terrified, and there's another part that is longing, longing for that again. Anyways, so there's this couple sitting in front of me, and they're, uh, they were in their 80s, and... Uh, Halfway through the exercise, I looked down, and they're both kind of weeping. And uh, I almost stopped it. I felt like, you know, I've got my mom and dad here, and I, gotta, I can't put them through this. <laughs> that they were in pain. <clears throat> but I didn't. I let them go. And at the end, I went straight to them. And I said, I noticed that that was, seemed upsetting for you, or you were, there's tears. Is there anything you want to say about that? And she said, you know, we have a good marriage. Nothing wrong has happened. We've been busy raising our children and our grandchildren. We have a nice house. We, you know, we're kind to each other. But I didn't know who he was. I have not looked at him that long, ever. And I just always thought that he wasn't really there in terms of his soul that he was just my husband, the father of my children, you know, was a good provider, passes out on the couch every night now and when the news comes on. That's just what he is. And I looked and she says, I, I really saw him and I didn't know he existed. And I loved what I saw. And he said precisely the same thing. And I was kind of just stunned, stunned by this that we could spend that amount of time actually not knowing who the other one really is. I mean, you think, just reflect in your relationship all the things you do to actually defend from actually knowing each other. More in relationship with what you think you know and not so much curious about what you don't know anymore. And yet there's an infinite amount of what is not known. I'm asked to conduct wedding ceremonies now and then. I don't hand out my business cards for that, but I asked to do that. And in one in one couple, I just sort of uh, spontaneously, I did Doug. To, where is he? Is he gone? Just comes and sets this thing up and then he leaves. <laughs> I, I did. I was. I ministered his wedding just down, down the street here. Uh, a week and a half ago. And I almost said this and I didn't. I, I, I kind of regret it because I've said this in other weddings that I have the, the couple look at each other and have them begin to commit to being in a relationship to the endless mystery of not knowing the other. That you will never know this person entirely, but that you're committing to knowing as much as you possibly can. 
that who we are intrinsic in our soul and our nature is as wide and as infinite as the universe itself. You are in a sacred connection. You are there to be catalysts, to view the entirety of the, of the dimension of not just self and soul, but the universe itself. Nothing has to happen but wit- just witnessing each other. So this is, what, this is what's available. And I'll, I never forget it. I never, ever forget it. I, I should, I'll correct that. I forget it. I'll never not remember it. <laughs> I forget it and I, and I remember it. I forget it and I remember it. I always come back to remembering it. Because my life is important enough to remember that. I'm very, very happy when I remember remembering that. I'm very unhappy when I don't. I like to be happy. And happiness is never going to come as a result of me being Superman. Happiness is never going to come as a result of me feeling like Catherine is sucking the very life out of me. (laughs) Happiness is never going to come to me in any kind of defended state. So as justified as you feel to remain where you are, doing what you do, ask yourself, what's that ultimate price tag? You know, you could say, why should I? Why should I? I don't want to do that. Just leave me alone. I'm fine. Why should I? That's a really good question. Why should you? Is this the the net result of your dream of your life? Is for you to be in a place of just being arrested? I hope not. I really, really hope not. Because that is not the reason you're here, is to figure out new and better ways of being defended so you can be alone and safe, but profoundly alone. Profoundly alone. I, I, I am, uh, in my private counseling practice, I'm, I'm astounded with, as, as, as so many people have so many people around them and have families, when they come into my office, I'm, I'm actually, sh- more often than not, people come and say, I'm, I'm really a- alone. Nobody really knows me. I, I am this there and I'm that there and I tell so much here and I tell, but you know what? I am so alone. And I'm tired of being alone. We are so alone. When we're defended, we are alone. I don't care if somebody's leaning on your shoulder. You're alone. So we're here for much, much, much more than that. And that becomes a hero's journey. You, have, you, know, you can't just decide to move through that. You have to decide uh, to take action, to use your relationships for a different purpose now, to ask yourself how, how frequent is it, even in my friendships, in my, in my workplace, not just my primary relationship. But how much am I doing that? How, how much am I defended everywhere I go? What can I do in those relationships that would actually be different? Where I can be accountable and responsible for myself in them and, what, and the things that go on in them. And use all your relationships for a different purpose. Again, because you actually are worth it. Because the quality of your life will be engaged, it'll be alive, it'll be seeking the purpose in all relationships all of the time. And as A Course of Miracles teaches us, there are, whenever two meet, it's a holy encounter. Any two, anywhere, anytime. When any two meet, it's a holy encounter. Meaning any two at any point in time can realize something far, far beyond the surface structure of how we normally engage. And that doesn't mean to, to, to have a primary relationship with everybody you meet. It might be somebody you just meet in an elevator. And your relationship is, you know, from the first floor to the fifth floor. But something different can happen in that relationship. You can let a person see part of yourself. You can show part of yourself. You can, you can extend part of yourself. You can be curious about the other so much can I've had so much fun in elevators. 
I was once, uh, in, when we were doing this, one of these tape series, the Fear to Love tape series in Chicago. There's, I forget what building that was, but it's, it's one of the tallest buildings in America. It's, it's an unbelievably tall building. And from the first floor to, I think, the 160th floor or whatever it was, I held an aerobics class. <laughs> I can do it. Because I wanted to. Anything can happen at any point in time if you've evaluated that the quality of your existence deserves that. And you're out of this craziness around my life is your fault. So what I'd like to do... Uh, you want to try this eye-gazing thing? Yeah. Let's get a little brave. For some, it'll be easy. Some of you maybe already do it. But actually, for couples, it's... Even couples that are together and apparently happy, it's, 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 it is the most difficult thing to do. I've, never, I, I am a, I've watched couples start laughing at each other, at the absurd, absurd notion that we're looking at each other. They can't handle it. And I usually say, don't feel bad about that. Let yourself laugh it out. <laughs> Something else will emerge after that. So there's no right or wrong or good or bad in this. But we, I'm just going to ask everybody, and it doesn't have to be a member of the opposite sex. It could be a, any, any two people. But if you are here with your partner, please do this with your partner. So let's just, we're just going to do this for a couple of minutes. Just, if you would just find someone and then just be silent and just look in their eyes and I'll tell you when we're actually going to begin. <laughs> Okay, so when you have someone, look, actually look in their eyes now. Don't avoid each other. Look at each other and be silent. No words. Shh. Just look in this person. You turn your body to this person too. Okay, so no words. Not a word. Words in a situation like this become are just defenses. Just look at the person. Shh. And find that eye where you say, you say to yourself, oh, there you are. And just lock in on that one eye instead of bouncing back and forth. Who is this? Who am I? Here I am. I am letting you see me. The eyes are like a pathway to the soul. They can't lie. And your soul so much wants to come out. Okay, if you feel comfortable, just give this person a hug. Okay, we're going to continue this exercise a little bit. We're just having a little chat with each other. I want you to have a little chat about this idea. Who, if you are saying to yourself, my life is your fault, who is that person? Who have you been blaming for your predicament? <laughs> We've only got a few minutes, so we just... <laughs> and then, so I'm, I'm going to give you about just a... a a couple of minutes each, just to briefly be honest about who you're blaming. And then you're going to ask yourself the question, oh, we're going to have a washroom break. <laughs> the question, what is the real battleground? If who I'm blaming is not the battleground, what is the real battleground? See if you can identify a bit about yourself to this person. All right? So you're going to talk first of all, all about who have you been blaming for your life? And we all have people. The second part is, if that isn't the problem, then what is the real problem inside of me? What am I hiding from inside of me? If I was responsible about myself, what would I be saying about me? All right, so I'll give you each, like, uh, go to one person, do two minutes on what, who, who you're blaming, two minutes on what the real problem is, and then we'll switch sides. All right, so I'll let, every two minutes I'll say two minutes up, 
then I'll repeat the question. So who's to blame for your life? Okay, that's two minutes, so that person now will now say what is the real battleground inside of, the, of that themselves. Okay, you're going to go to the other person now, the same two questions. And now to the question, what is the real battleground? Okay, and you might also want to just have a word about what the eye gazing was like for you. What, did that, what happened for you in the eye gazing? If you really want to have an exciting time, try the eye gazing for two hours. I'm serious. It's uh, the most exciting thing I've ever done in my life. It's unbelievable what can happen. All right. We can come back now. So I want to summarize a little bit because I want you to, before we get to taking some questions, before Angela comes up here and gives away some things. Um, my wish for you is that when you leave here tonight that you'll be carrying that question. How much do I need to keep the battleground outside of myself? How much in my complaining about all these things outside of myself do I need these things to stay unresolved outside of myself so I don't have to look at me? <laughs> Oh, that's a, that's a humbling, sober confession to yourself. And if you can answer that question completely, your life, I guarantee, will change. You can actually come out of victim consciousness because that's what we're talking about. To completely, entirely remove yourself from any victim state mentality. Because in the victim state, you are condemning yourself to death. And if you want to find out why we do that, come to the workshop. I'm serious. When you find out what's going on beneath this whole thing, what we're up to, what we're doing to ourselves, and for what reason, you can change your life. And I want to, I want to um, just read a little passage from a book called The Purpose of Your Life by uh, Carol Adrian. Um, there's a Zen parable I want to read because it really speaks to the mystery of our existence and the mystery of why things happen. Because if we can get out of this kind of concluding state of mind, when something happens, we like to make up our mind of what we think it is and what it's for, what it means, right? Real quickly, we think we know what it means and that's the end of the story. Don't talk to me about it anymore. That's what it means. We don't know what anything means. And if you begin to commit yourself to 
the mystery, the unveiling of the infinite mystery of all situations that we never actually know what they truly mean. More, each situation is bringing us closer and closer to the ultimate reality of our existence, and that is that the universe is a friendly place. When we stay curious enough, long enough, and inside and remain in a situation long enough with curiosity, that is the ultimate conclusion about everything. And the only thing that's differentiating us between enlightened masters is knowing that. So I want, I want to read you this little, just this little parable. A farmer who had just acquired a stallion came to the Zen master in distress saying, Master, the horse is gone, the horse is gone. For the stallion had run away. The Zen master replied, who knows if it's good or bad? The farmer returned to his work, feeling sad and miserable, and two days later the stallion returned and brought with him two mares. The farmer was overjoyed, and he went to the Zen master saying, the horse is back and has brought two others with him. This is good. The master replied, Who knows if it's good or bad? Three days later, the farmer was back again, crying because his only son, his only helper on the farm, had been thrown from one of the horses, and his back had been broken. He was now in a body cast and could do no work. The Zen master again replied, Who knows if it's good or bad? A few days later, a group of soldiers came to the farm, as they were conscripting all the young men in the area to fight in a war, since the farmer's son was in a body cast, they did not take him. And the Zen master said, who knows if this is good or bad? We never know. But we all know it's leading to good. So I leave that thought with you, and, oh, we're going to take some questions. That's what we're going to do. We have a microphone there, so if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask... And there are many. Sorry? The Purpose of Your Life by Carol Adrian. I'm going to wait. Give yourself permission. Yes? Well, but it really helps because everybody can hear you. Your voice is important. What if you're struggling with what your battleground is? How can you kind of tap into that a little more than... than I just, I just don't feel like I've tapped into what my, my inner battleground is. Yeah, do you're, you're, you feel like you were just scratching the surface with that? Yeah. Right. Well, the first, the first one is to be interested in it and to not give up the moment you find it's difficult to, to uncover. I mean, somebody asked me once when I was lecturing in Sweden, if you could, if you could uh, reduce this down to one directive that will make everything work, <laughs> right? And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, that's quite a question. What is it? And I said, to be interested. To, to be unwavering in your interest about that battleground inside of yourself such that no matter what other thoughts come in, which are going to be, well, gee, I can't find it. May as well just give up. What's the point? I don't know. Read, study, talk. Take, a, take one of these workshops. You want to find out? How many people here have done the awakening? Put up your hands. Do you think she'll find that battleground? Yes. That's where, I'm serious. I mean, it's just everything is geared towards moving, finding that and moving through it. And it's, and it's for those that are interested enough to do that. Is your life important enough to you to do that? You say it is. I mean, if, you're, if the part of you that is wanting, it is joining with the part of you that you're going to discover underneath it. It's like if a person wants peace, the, the part of them that's seeking peace already has it. So the part of you that's interested is joining with yourself. But if you're new, if this is, is this new to you? 
sort of? No. Okay. I've done the forum. Right. Okay, you've done the forum. The forum is a little bit less about going into the battleground, more about uh, outcome focus in terms of getting through it and to some other uh, place as opposed to really moving through this. Yeah. Any other questions? Come on, this is my favorite part. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, do, Maria? 7.50. It's 7.50 and it includes the, the workshop, the lodging, and the food for the entire weekend. You, you stay out at uh, Springbrook out in Langley. I think there's one at the end of June. Uh, Angela will be talking about that. Yes, can we have the microphone over here? How did you... Cut? Did you say you hope it's not too personal? I hope it's not too personal. Oh, I hope it is too personal. <laughs> There's nothing I hate worse than an impersonal question on a personal topic. You know, it's kind of weird. People talk about somebody else or this hypothetical principle. And really, you know, I want, to, I want contact. I, my question is, how did you work through your depression? Oh, boy. How did I work through my depression? When I applied what I'm talking about here tonight, I really absolutely believe that my depression was entirely her fault. And the reason that I stayed depressed was her fault. And I didn't realize the reason I was depressed actually was keeping... I was depressed because I was making her the, the problem. I worked through my depression when I started taking accountability and responsibility for my state. That this wasn't... She didn't drive me here. This is a place I chose to go to because this is what I made up about myself is all I really deserved. And I was in the middle of an identity crisis. I got through my depression because I started... I think all depression is really an identity crisis. Because people are in such a conundrum about who am I. And unfortunately, the ego answers the question, I'll tell you who you are. You're nothing. You're no good. You're inadequate. You're unworthy. You're, ex you're a miserable excuse. You know, you're a flawed. All those voices were running me all the time. And I met them head on. I remember ask, telling myself, how can I believe any part of my own mind that wants to kill me? How can I hold it with such trust? How come I start my day by having a consultation with my ego mind to how we're going to plan our day together based on how, how my assessment of myself? So I had to challenge. I had to challenge those thoughts. And I also had to let the emotions that were inside of me begin to move them out instead of just being defended and taking drugs or whatever I had to do to, to not feel that. that. That feeling also was a betrayal of the passage I was going through. Like I said, it was an identity crisis. That's what a rite of passage is. In Aboriginal cultures, when you go on your walkabout, you are in the middle of your identity crisis. Who am I? And that's what I was going through, was really this profound question, who am I? I was in a situation where I felt like I was losing every aspect of who I was. The musician in me, the family therapist in me, the homeowner in me, because I lost all my money, I lost everything. And I thought that I was losing pieces of me. I didn't realize at the very end the only thing left was me. And my depression was more a battle resisting that passage. When we're depressed, most people that are depressed are trying to get back what they had. All I wanted was to have back what I had. Not realizing that maybe I had to lose what I had to get where I was going. And depression, a lot of that is this distrust in the passage. We fight it. We resist it. We want to stay in control of it. It's a very arrogant state, depression. Because we think we have the answer to everything. And it's a black answer. We're not curious about any new information. We think we have the answer to it all. So it was a very, very intense passage for me because I fought tooth and nail. Yeah. So I never forget that. I'll never forget the depth of what that was all about for me, even though it was now over 15 years ago. I'll never, ever forget it. And it, and it has been a gift to me because it's provided me with a certain sensitivity about the delicacy of the human psyche, that I don't go over any of these things lightly and respect the human condition profoundly. 
Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, right over there. Um, I had a question about um, how to deal with a reaction when um, you feel you that you're being blamed for someone else's life. Because I find it really easy to get into a dance where it's like, okay, well, you might blame me for this, but look at what you've done to our relationship now. <laughs> so kind of get involved in that, the blaming for the relationship. So our relationship is your fault, you know? You mean how do you react to somebody else blaming you for, that you're responsible for, the, for their life? Yeah, and also my opinion that, that of what that does to the relationship. Yeah, well, that's just going to key your same attitude towards him there. Is it him? Oh, no, her. Her. <laughs> lies, I didn't know you were so we, We've got to clear up. It's not this guy sitting beside My mom. It's my mom. I'm thinking about my mom. Yeah. It's not Campbell, right? Yes. Yeah. No, it's not me. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> you first of all have to watch your own reaction. Are you going to begin to do the same thing? That my current unhappiness is because you're blaming me for everything and you're just returning, you're, that's you're the same move. But now you feel justified because they're doing it. Mm -hmm. Most people feel justified what they're doing because they think it's already been done to them too. Most people are not, are not acting so much as reacting in their mind. Everybody's reacting. They think it's all justified. So for, you, have to, you can't wait for the other to do it different before you're going to do it different. You have to decide you're going to do it different. Even in the middle of her doing that, I'll tell you, you know, with mothers, most of the time when they're doing that, I'll tell you what they're up to. <laughs> you know, mothers, for the most part, never feel like their job is done. Their assessment of themselves when they were a mother were they never did it completely right, so they've got to keep doing it now. So when they're doing that, it's because they care about you. And the only way they know how to care about you is to be over-functioning and critical. <laughs> but they're caring about you. So what you can do in the middle of that is don't get, take any of those hooks and just go over to your mom and say, thanks for caring about me and give her a hug. I'm serious. Because that's the soul of it. She, yeah, actually, there's probably a wound and a vulnerability around her own uh, assessment of her own mothering that she still has to do it now. Okay. Do we have one more? Yes, over here. Thank you. I just wanted to ask, um, in my uh, last relationship I had was about two years long, and I spent most of it trying to save her. Mm. That, you know, did all these wonderful things took her to all these different events and activities to save her psychologically or save her in her spirit. Yeah. And so what's behind that for me? Why did I, why am I compelled to spend two years doing this? Now, it didn't save her at all, of course. I can't. It can't. It, nothing happened. All my love and connection didn't really do anything, really. Mm -hmm. So what was, that, what was behind that for me that I need to deal with? Your inadequacy. <laughs> your fear of your inadequacy. Inadequ that you had to overfunction and overcompensate for it by not, not good enough. That not good enough. So you got to be give it your own little Superman, you know, your spiritual Superman, your helper Superman. That I have to do this in order to qualify to have this relationship function work because God only knows it wouldn't work if I was just being myself. I have to do this. I have to do that. I have to do more. So your job is to find out how. Where did you make up your mind about that? When did that become your life skill? based on what life experience. I imagine it's put similar to mine in a way. Right? Well, it was with my dad. You know, I was never good enough with my dad. Yeah, so that's where that's you've got the script. Yeah. And, and, and it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, no matter how good you get at that, at some point in time, if you save her, she's going to want to be... Have to, she won't, wait, wait, what if you did save her? Yeah, then, then she's going to want to be close to you. And, and then I don't have a gig anymore. That's right. Yeah. Right. Now what do we do? That's precisely it. That's, and then it's an identity crisis. Yeah. That's why the supermen don't want the wounded birds to get better. <laughs> because if they do, then who are you? Oh, so man. you find secret ways of keeping them wounded or pointing out areas that they still need to work on. I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <No. laughs> folks. I'm going to be uh, over here for sitting down if anybody wants to talk to me privately afterwards. And I say thank you very much. It's been a great evening for me.